So this is the title of uh, the webinar today. For those of you who have joined before, you maybe know the agenda, but let's have a look to make sure we're all clear on the objective today. How do we build a successful remote team? And we've got some experts here who are going to share their knowledge, give you some good tips and strategies for leaders on how to build a successful remote team. Safety Wing itself is a global remote team and I'm delighted to partner with them. Well, I'm the moderator today and I'm looking forward to facilitating the panel. Rowena Hennigan, you can check out my LinkedIn link there or have a wee Google and you'll find me online. And moving along, we're also going to have a look at what Safety Wings offers. So global benefits, global health for a remote workforce. You've got uh, obviously the beautiful graphics. I love the graphics, the funky graphics that the Safety Wing team uses. And they're all about building a global safety net, a social safety net. We can see their product roadmap there building into the future. And remote health is a key part of that for borderless global remote teams. So check them out if you haven't had a chance to do that. Today's agenda, the way we're going to structure it is just to get going, we're going to kick off with a poll to make it quite interactive before we move into the panel discussion and finish off with the Q&A. So you'll see the poll popping up on the screen and we'll give it a minute or two for you to answer. Charles is part of the backroom team for Safety Wing, so he's going to leave that poll there. And the question is essentially, is your organization already borderless? Maybe you're going to answer no. Maybe you have a remote team locally, which is increasingly the case. Not all remote teams are, are across borders. We have very, very, very big countries and regions, as we know, in the world, like India and Africa. And some of those are within those geographical borders, some remote teams and organizations. So maybe the answer is no. Maybe you're looking at becoming borderless into the future. And maybe you're happy to share as well the amount of countries, the number of countries that you currently operate in. So we always run this poll at the start as an icebreaker and also to get a feel for the range and the type of audience that we have on the session today. So we'll give it a minute for you to answer. Looking forward to seeing that answer, seeing how many, what the different spread of attendees and their experience is. So we'll give it another few seconds. If you haven't answered, just let us know what your plans, select one of the following answers. And um, we're still collecting responses and we'll look to present those now in the next minute or so. Cur I'm curious to see what the spread is. We've got almost, I think 80% voted in the poll. So let's have a look. So our 21% no, don't have plans. Maybe you're looking, as I said, at a more regional, a local geographic remote team structure. We're definitely going to get uh, tips today and tips and tricks on that. Some people, 13% looking to plan this strategically into the future, 10% in two countries, 22% in three to five countries, and 34% in six or more countries. That's interesting to me. It's over 50, 56% there of people attending today who have voted who are in more than three countries. So that's quite a healthy healthy amount there, interesting to see. So thanks for sharing that, gives us a good idea. And let me welcome today the wonderful panel. So I'm gonna go around the panel in a minute and ask them to introduce themselves. Looking around the virtual room, I've got Ali who's geographically near me and right beside me on the virtual room. So Ali's down, in, down the road in Barcelona from Zaragoza. So buenas, buenas tardes Ali to you. We'll get you to introduce yourself in one moment. Then we'll go over to Vera who's based in Belgian Vera Lackmacher, and then over to Stanislav, who's over in New York, over the pond, as they say. So Ali, give us a 30 second introduction, please. Thank you very much, Rowena. Thank you so much for having me. And it's great to see the uh, the attendees uh, on, a, on, a, on an afternoon uh, joining and, and making time for this. So I really appreciate it and, and uh, look forward to this, uh, to this session. So yeah, I'm Ali. I'm the founder and CEO of Juno. Founded Juno just over four years ago after having thought that we should really do more to empower employees to make their own decisions when it comes to benefits and when it comes to their relationship with their employer. You know, our vision is to become the preferred destination for modern companies uh, to look after their team. Uh, we really try and encourage employers to put the power in the hands of their team um, and their employees and individuals. Obviously, they're all over the world, so we have people using Juno in. 76 countries at the moment, which is pretty nuts. We're the only 
truly global and borderless benefits platform in the world uh, and the, the impact is clear when we give people the power to choose of course everyone being different uh, you've got you know stressed out managers in new york going to pilates classes after work we've got uh you know people taking their kids on vacations in parts of the world we've got people taking therapy remote therapy when they need it um, and it really is enabling remote work um, for people you know of course uh, for, for these progressive tech companies uh, so the idea here is putting the power in the hands of employees to make their own decisions and changing the dynamic between employees and employees so that's that's everything that we care about over at Juno and for ourselves internally we have people all over the world um, predominantly Europe we do have someone in South Africa um, we have been remote since day one we've been uh, global since day one and we're very very fortunate to say that it's working well for us Fantastic, Ali. You really practice what you preach with the Juno team. I know that I've come across some of them in my travels. So not only an expert on the benefits for remote teams and global teams, but also practicing what you preach running your own remote team there at Juno. Welcome, welcome. So over to Vera in Belgium. Hello, I'm Vera Lackmaker. Um, it's my personal mission to uh, make remote work more human and connect uh, humans through play. I'm a former head of remote at the gaming company and remote work champion at a team building company. I am now uh, helping remote work junkie to connect uh, job seekers uh, to remote jobs as their uh, content and outreach specialist. And um, it's also a site to inform and educate. And I'm looking for my own uh, next adventure. So uh, that's very good. Uh, furthermore, I really look at, I have a background in gaming, so I really look at how we can take lessons from, from gaming and, and my own experience in connecting humans and connecting teams. So I'm, I'm really to making it human, making it personal, and uh, that's why I'm here today. Fantastic, Vera. What a good, diverse, what amazing, diverse panel we have. And Vera is also one of the few there's only a handful in the world who can say she's been ahead of remote it's an emerging job title and profile and we're very privileged to have vera with us today because she comes along with a wealth of experience so thanks for joining vera really appreciate it over the pond stanislav tell us how it is in new york today <laughs> it's a pretty sunny day thank you so much for the warm introduction marina <clears throat> i'm very excited to be part of the panel today um, so I'm a senior manager, I'm a senior program manager for the product and partnerships team at Andela. Andela is a um, essentially a premium talent network place where we, our logo, uh, our motto is to connect brilliance with opportunity. And so if you think about it, brilliance is distributed evenly, but opportunity unfortunately is not. So we're working to bridge that gap. Um, I'm currently focusing on building a strong health insurance product where we basically offer um, not direct benefits, but um, um, negotiated down terms and premiums to our contractors all over Africa, Southeast Asia, South America. And that's essentially how I started, you know, working with Safety Win. And one thing led to another. Now I'm here with you guys. <laughs> oh, fantastic. <laughs> that's fantastic, Sanslav. So it's really good to have such a diverse. And I love that you're bringing in that angle as well about equality and equal access, all the things. So we've got we've got fantastic range on the panel, lots of expertise. So let's jump straight in to it's such a wide topic, building a successful remote team. So we do have some prompt questions, but what I did want to kick off with, and I'm going to go to Stanislav first, then go back to Vera and over to Ali, was with the question that if you had 30 seconds in a hotel elevator, you've probably heard this one, and someone said to you, give me 30 seconds on what I need to know. What's your top tip or tips in 30 seconds on building remote teams, building a successful remote team? What knowledge would you impart in those 30 seconds? So it's a, it's a hard one to start off with, but it'll set this scene, okay? So Stanislav, going to you first, then over to Vera, then to Ali. What would you answer to that? Um, that's a great um, way to sort of prop the conversation here. It's it's hard to say, but I remember, I think the biggest problem is that I remember looking at the report recently by Gallup and it was like 51% of employees feel you know, disengaged at the, in the workplace. And obviously, if you think in the context of like remote work, it's actually a bit harder to stay engaged, right? And for me, I think in my experience in personal life, it 
honestly boils down to really good leadership presence, uh, making sure that you uh, know what the values are for your, you know, team members or the employees you're working with, what they value as, you know, professionally and personally, what their goals are, where they're trying to get to. And so then just kind of co-creating the value together and understanding how you can support them in, in that journey. And that for me, it's honestly like the best strategy you can take on as of today, right? In the mindset that I have today, that's what I would say in that elevator. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. I love it. And that co-creating, I'm going to jump on that word because that's one of the words I think that really in our current in our current society, we want to look more at that engagement. You said employees are feeling disengaged because they don't feel that they can co-create anything because they feel that hierarchical model that is more traditional and maybe more old at this stage. So hopefully that's something that people can take away a couple of good words in relation to that. Vera, what would you add on to what Stanislav has said? Totally agree. I think that the first tip I would give is that you have to relearn almost everything. Uh, you you have to be not to be afraid to let things that you have known, let it go and try to indeed experiment. Uh, for me, it, it's indeed co-creating. It's, it's, it starts with leadership, everything, but it's also trying to be human, trying to be vulnerable, um, trying to, to create a sense of, okay, well, I'm, I'm dealing, even though there is the screen, I know that there is a colleague next to me, a, a human of fresh, of a flesh and blood that has feelings, maybe has, has a great day, maybe has a shitty day. You don't know what's going on. So it's, it's, it's taking the first step just to say, okay, how are you doing? Just, just a, a colleague of mine said, I'm so, Whenever I ask a question, the first thing you always ask is, how are you doing? And not how are you doing, but how are you really doing? That question is so powerful. And uh, being transparent, being being generally interested in, in the person behind the screen, I think that's the most important lesson there is. Beautiful. And that built totally on what Stanislav has said. And you gave me some really practical tips there, Vera. And the power of asking, how are you really, really doing? And then waiting to hear, digest, and, and, and take on the answer as a leader and take it to the next step. I really like that. I think they work really well together. Ali, what would you say in your 30 seconds? Yeah, I think that remote work is really the emblem of a massive change. And obviously change is something that tends to come up against resistance. People aren't always keen on change. But I think that ultimately, like any change or any progression or any forward futuristic move or leap, um, the benefits will always outweigh the, the costs and the initial frictions will eventually get solved over time. You know, if you think about it, remote work has obviously been a phenomenon for, for decades, but actually COVID fast forwarded everything and forced us to reckon with that reality, which means that, of course, there are lots of issues with the fact that we don't feel connected. There are lots of issues with the fact that, you know, for a lot of people, they feel burnt out, disengaged. But you know, this is literally year three of a mass remote work um, event, okay? And there will be decades forward, and, and, and resistance is futile. You know, this is the future, and ultimately, you know, we have to embrace it. We need to accept that uh, we're w looking into a new paradigm of work where it's a lot more centralized on the individual. It's decentralized in many ways, less sort of monolithic. It's not about going into one big office block in one big center in the metropolitan area. It's decentralized. And we see that obviously in other parts of society. So we need to embrace it. We need to accept that it has its flaws that it's not perfect, that we will lose things that we missed and cherished, but that you can't have perfection. And that overall, the benefit far outweighs the costs and the frictions will be solved over time. Beautiful, and there's a thread between all those three answers uh, centralized on the individual. So yeah, your piece there, Ali, very much leans into what Vera and Stanislav said as well. So can I sum up, if you'll allow me, or right, if you'll allow me, because what the title of today's panel and today's webinar is looking at how to successfully create remote teams. And the message we've got from that first prompt is that you can enable those remote workers to also help create those teams and build that remote culture and infrastructure. 
because after, as you said, Ali, mm. and as Mr. Matt Mullenweg very elegantly put on the 5th of March, 2020, after the remote work experiment that no one asked for, because we were all forced to work from home for a long period of time, which is not the same <laughs> as true remote work under duress, after that, we're all in the same situation nearly, never mind the media, that most people have the skills to remote work effectively, those that like it, those that choose it, it's all about choice as well, as we know, it's not for everyone all of the time, but it is for everyone sometimes, that's what I like to think about. So if we think about that analogy of creating and building a remote team, successful remote team, that's empowering those individual remote workers and members of your team. What practical piece of advice, particularly on communication, so we'll start there first rather than collaboration, what has worked well with your teams in your structures? I'll go to Ali, then to Vera, then to Stanislav. What has worked well in terms of building out effective communication? So let's not talk about the tech first, let's talk more about the, the, the practical strategies or, or the theory. What's worked well in terms of communication for your teams at Juno Alley and how you support effective remote communication? Sure. I mean, we're, we're far from getting it completely right. If I'm being completely, if I'm being honest, you know, we, we love a good Slack. We love a good thread. We love having meetings with 13 people sometimes. Um, and you know, part of that is obviously we like to be together, but I don't know if I would call that effective. Uh, certainly not uh, efficient. Um, but I think that ultimately for us, it's we do, and I know that this is something that gets bandied about, but I do feel like we are maybe not strictly a flat structure, but it feels like one. Uh, it feels like one in the sense that everybody's thoughts, opinions, and perspectives are considered. And I, I wonder how much the, the sort of the typed word helps in flattening structures, whereby perhaps in the past we were reliant on our positions, our ages, our experience, oftentimes our genders and other sorts of biases that actually held us back from being treated as equal in terms of our opinion and our perspectives. Whereas now it is, you know, pixels on a screen, perhaps that might mean that We've enabled slightly more equity amongst an organization that if someone has something to say or an opinion or a thought or a consideration that that's treated in a different way. So aside from that, we can probably talk about that as a separate topic. We're not perfect by any stretch, but I think that we, you know, we, we definitely encourage um, everybody to speak up. We aren't that big, to be fair. Uh, you know, we're less than 30 people, so that probably helps a little bit. Um, so look, it's a, it's definitely something that we're working on. Uh, those 13 people meetings are fun, but probably don't get much done. Uh, <laughs> but I think that, you know what I'm proud of is everybody gets the chance to to speak up. Everybody gets the chance to be heard. Everybody gets the chance to. I don't think anyone is afraid to to voice their opinions. Uh, our, our Slack chats do get quite lively often. So so that's how, how I feel. I I observe and how remote work has enabled that for the better. Beautiful and some honest sharing there as well, because I think there's been a lot, maybe too much in the media about perfect meetings. And certainly I know, and to all your earlier points, some people do like to chat. They do like to have the opportunity to debate things out and not totally be on a Slack thread in writing. So perhaps that belonging piece, Ali, is just as important. And maybe you're getting it righter than you think. That would be my observation there, if your team all feel that they can contribute that way. Vera, what would you add there in terms of building a communication structure that supports effective remote teams? I would say that from my own experience, I always worked in small organizations. Um, what's effective is to make sure to understand that uh, not everyone communicates in the same way. Uh, you know, you have your introverts, you have your extroverts, you have your ambiverts, uh, you have people who really love reading lots and lots of uh, Slack threads, uh, documentation. You also have the people who just like a good, you know, a good video uh, recording, like Loom. Um, so, so I always cater to the per person itself. Uh, but to be effective, you, you, it, it, it still comes down to finding a, a creating a space where people can collaborate. So indeed, a, what GitLab calls a single sort of truth is the basis of everyone, uh, everything. And um, based on that, have a 
a, a couple of general guidelines on how you want to communicate. So, for example, um, if your organization is really uh, in the same time zones, it, it might be easier to, to um, uh, create lots and lots of Slack uh, because everyone will be working at the same. So different different threads, different DMs. Um, but what I notice is that it will clog up. You know, it will clog up your energy. It will clog on uh, clog up your uh, your focus. So I'm really, uh, it's been discussed a lot. But really, try to be intentional on the way you communicate and the way you you leverage sync asynchronous uh, communication. Um, for me, you know, I, I love meetings, but the thought of having 13 people at the meeting is uh, uh, is not for me. I, I really like small meetings, so you know, uh, the one on ones, the uh, three persons max, because I think more things are being effective, and I think it 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 allows people who are quite shy themselves to speak up more. Um, also, indeed, doing it in video and in writing gives people the, the chance to just soak it in and come up with a, um, uh, what's it called, a, a uh, reaction in their own time. So being more intentional about it, it I think that's the most important uh, part of being, you know, uh, to having an effective uh, strategy. Beautiful, some fantastic nuggets of information and learning there. Love that, uh, Vera, really, really good. And I loved your point about everyone's different communication styles. So in the theory of remote work, if you want to go out and Google uh, remote work team charter or hybrid team charter, you will find communication charters out there that help to lay out some of this. And one of the sections under that is often personal preferences. So that leans into Vera's point there of being aware that not everyone will want to do meetings or slacks or whatever, and, and how we can try and accommodate that as leaders. Stanislav, what would you add on communication structures? Uh, the really good comments there. Um, I would say I couldn't personally stress the importance of communication, especially in the context of remote work. And I think for me, what I've seen, and I've worked for you know di different companies and like big corporations and small ones and stuff like that. And I think it's really important to set up a safe psychological environment. Going back to Alice's point, to actually encourage people to be able to speak up and where they feel actually comfortable sharing their thoughts and opinions and maybe even reservations on you know, a certain strategy and stuff like that. And that goes a long way. And obviously that comes, and that actually creates a great opportunity for curiosity, right? And when you can sort of foster that sense of curiosity, that's when, that's when innovation happens. That's when people actually you know, start kind of taking on more initiatives, trying to research things, trying to figure out what they can do um, to change like certain situations stuff like that. Another piece I would say um, is setting up transparency uh, from the get-go. And you know, as a leader, especially in the context of like the most recent events, layoffs happening, the economic downturn happening in the states. Um, not sure. I think it's probably the same in Europe as well. But um, you don't always have all the answers as a leader, as you know, as a person, because sometimes you just also trying to figure it out as you go, right? You don't know exactly what's gonna happen like in two months and three months, you know, if the budgets are gonna be approved and stuff like that. So it's important to be actually transparent and share how you came to that like understanding and decision-making with your team, because that way you sort of treat them as equal and they know exactly what's, what's going on through your head. And when you share that out as well, it again goes back to that curiosity aspect and maybe they can come up with like creative solutions that you've never thought about or, you know, your peers didn't think about about and then it, again but that's sort of like a few strategies on the communication piece in terms of like actually a bigger strategy right but immediately like things that really help me when I have a meeting of course it depends on like how many people you have in a meeting and stuff like that but I would actually be very intentional about how I would go and ask for everyone's opinion too because some people might be new to the company you know they don't know exactly what the culture is what to expect like what they can say they cannot and sort of kind of showcase maybe sharing something out that I think you know holds value to me and I think it's important and then sort of encouraging that behavior but of course that's just it's not an immediate process that takes some time to cultivate that strong sort of learning might culture growth culture right it doesn't come immediate but sort of starting with yourself and setting up an example is, goes a long way as well 
Wonderful, and there's some fantastic. So I love you said psychological safety sounds of the because it was weaved within that. Because how can we have a foundation of good communications in a team if people are nervous or don't feel safe? So that leads us into, and you've all touched on it in different ways when, with your answer, but it leads us into how do we create that, not just psychological safety, but that feeling of connection, social connection, connection within a remote team. Now, I'm going, I'm very conscious we're in an economic downturn, we've got budget challenges everywhere. So when I go to each one of you, and I'm going to go to Vera first, then to uh, Stanislav, then to Ali, can you answer this about making connection or fostering connection, right? Building those relationships. And I've seen a question coming in as well about how do you foster chemistry or team morale in remote teams? So it's all very linked. Can you answer based on the virtual environment only? Because let's assume people don't have budget for lots and lots of remote meetups around the world at the moment, because I think that is the reality, right? So can you answer with your advice on how to foster that social connection within your remote teams based on virtual. Okay, Vera, I'll start with you. Yeah, uh, so first I think it's it's important to to understand that the fostering of connection can can be is so tied to how we are as humans. Uh, as we are as humans, we, we, we aim to, I, I believe that you connect because you have some things in common. You either work, you either have a shared goal or a shared problem. So if you are in your team, you might have a very diverse team, but because you are solving a product, uh, you know, a, a problem for your customer, if you're in customer support or you share, you're working together on a difficult problem because you're a developer, you always have something that, that binds you. So um, that's something to be conscious about. Everyone can be different, but because you, you're you working together, it, you always have something to talk about. Um, fostering uh, connections, I think it's, it just starts in day, indeed again with, with um, spending time together. This can be done, you know, through, through games, which is my favorite way of connecting. Uh, but it can also be done by, by just asking how someone's day was, you know. Um, if, if you're a development team and, and you believe in um, stand-ups, uh, then just having a, a, a quick chat. It's like, hey, how was your day? What have you done uh, yesterday with, with your children, with your dog? Uh, it, it's about intentionally getting to know your colleague. So, for example, if if if, if I work with, uh, work with Ali and he, he has, you know, two children, I can ask, it's like, hey, how was child number one and number two? You know, what what's going on school? How, you know? Uh, how is your dog? I mean, I have pets, so you know the, the, the random uh, pictures uh, that I used to send to my to my to my uh, colleagues. It always, you know, great topic for conversation. I mean, I I chat with a lot of people. I've chicken, so somewhere in my random network uh, meetings, the chickens will will uh, will have something. Uh, so yeah, it's 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 just about getting to know each other. That's the first step. You don't have to invest in 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 large budgets and meetups. It just taking it back and, and, and create moments for people to connect. Whether it, this is virtual uh, within the all hands team meeting or in you know a, a team building session, it can also just be a one-on-one. -on -one. Encourage your, your uh, colleagues to just have 15 minutes uh, with everyone, you know, with one person in uh, a different section of the company is already a great way just to create those internal connections, building, you know, creating different uh, Slack um, channels just for, 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 you know, informal communication, talking about your pets, talking about, you know, your hobbies, that, that's already the best start to begin. Beautiful, Vera. And given the times we're living in, the, the challenge of the layoff, the economic challenges, I love how simple you brought that back down to. So maybe for people listening, Maybe they could just check in with themselves and say, when did we have fun? When did we I check in this week on people or last week? And as you say, don't complicate it too much. It can be as simple as a fun Slack channel. It can be as simple as a little quiz on a stand up or a social check in. So thanks for that. And lots of good tips there. Ali, what would you add to that? It's, I think it's important to, to remember that remote work doesn't mean you're banned from seeing each other in real life. So uh, we, we encourage people to travel, to see each other. I mean, for the UK folks who are everywhere, I mean, Scotland, Midlands, South of England, we obviously are more than encouraging and we pay and subsidize 
them to meet up when they want to. There's not forced. Um, for example, we have someone who lives in Porto, so we sent her colleague uh, from from the Midlands uh, to to go to Porto for a weekend. We said it's not about work. Go have fun. Go adventure. Get to know each other. Because obviously, you know, the fact is we are saving money on offices and so that budget can go somewhere. Um, so we, we remember, we try and remember that it's not like they're, they're banned from seeing each other. Um, but then the only thing I would add, because I think Vera's points were, were perfect, pitch perfect, uh, would be that we kind of encourage that in the onboarding. So obviously if, if someone joins, there is a, we, we give them a sort of 90 day plan, 30, 60, 90, and inside of that, there are definitely uh, expectations or, or kind of a, a structure around them embedding themselves, getting to know people. And I don't mean go and have a virtual coffee with every single person in the company, um, but there are set, certainly some structures in there that ensure that, that the team and that new onboarder are, I wouldn't say expected, but are encouraged, let's say, um, to, to, to get to know each other, I think. The only just final thing that I would add, which actually has ended up having an impact but further than my own intention is just for, for uh, the management team or whoever's in charge to be as transparent as possible when you share things that maybe aren't traditionally shared, um, such as, you know, our financial position, our runway, uh, you know, tailwinds, headwinds, kind of it brings people together. I mean, obviously, you know, there is a fine line. You don't want to uh put too much pressure on people or give them information that may not be useful for their for their day-to-day -day, uh, responsibilities but that being said you know we're a small team we're we're fighting against it building a startup we've got challenges and i think that inculcating and bringing everybody together around those things has meant that we have definitely bonded um and and built stronger uh, relationships as a result Fantastic and some really, really good advice there. And I'm just going to comment on some of the clients that I've worked with and Ali, you've hinted at this, have a budget quarterly. Again, some of those budgets may be challenged now for local team members to, to meet up, whether it be if they can get to each other in a geographical space or even to go out and socially connect in co-working or at meetups as well. So there's other ways to foster that. So very, very much concentrated in her answer on those virtual ways of supporting connection. Ali's giving you a broader view there as well, and you've nodded to onboarding, which is always so important, Ali, because if we bring in that practice at onboarding of fostering those connections, it often stays through the employee journey, doesn't it? Because you've set it up at the start. So pertinent point there. Stanislav, what would you add? Um, those are great points. I immediately, some of the tips or like, you know, strategies that comes to mind when working with your immediate team, right? Um, is um, I think called team charter. Essentially, it's kind of like a roadmap or a document, and we've used it. I've used it a lot in my previous role, and it honestly works wonders. So essentially, you sit, sit down with your team and you really understand what's what are the values for every single team member. What do they value in the work environment? How do they want to go about different projects? What are the goals for the team? Like where do we, where do we see yourself? And it actually creates that again, co-creating and co-shared sort of vision for the team, and everyone understands where each team member wants to go, uh, where do they want to maybe go professionally, maybe personally, and what areas and stuff like that. And it's really powerful but for like in the project program perspective, 100%, I highly recommend it. But to kind of talk about on a higher level, maybe to discuss a few strategies that have, have helped me in my uh, professional life is first to understand the values of that particular person, right? And it's not something immediate either, but like understanding where they're coming from, what's valuable to them. Is it financial stability? Is it, you know, um, freedom? Uh, you know, in the context of remote work, you have a lot of freedom you can do all sorts of different things. You may, maybe, maybe they need flexibility and stuff like that. And that would also kind of help you to create, create that stronger connection, understanding where they're coming from, where the guiding principles and sort of behavioral patterns are, you know, um, sourced from. So, for example, in my case, right, health is like number one core value to me. And so for me, like if I did really good at the job, if they just give me like one additional day of PTO, that would be perfect because then I can take care of my mental health. I can maybe just go visit some friends or do something, right? And so that is kind of like a super powerful in my opinion. And if you guys want to learn more about like core values and stuff like that, I'm a big advocate of Brene Brown. She wrote a great book, 
there to lead. She's done the whole section on core values there. Highly recommend checking it out. And then the second um, piece to keep in mind is the cultural perspective and cultural differences, right? So if you think about culture, I personally work a lot with people in like Africa, Southeast Asia, and South America. And there are sort of like a few different dimensions that the culture can be sliced by. And so there is this concept of collectivism versus individual, individualism, right? I live in the States, it's a highly individualistic culture. And so it's really easy to build a connection, Like right? You meet somebody, you say, hey, how's it going? Good to see you let's get started right you sort of build a connection right away but the quality of that connection is actually usually lower it's not as strong versus if you work somebody from a collectivistic cultural perspective like uh let's say in africa um, uganda or ghana kenya it takes a while to build that relationship they first need to establish strong trust right and so then you can sort of kind of get into understanding okay what's important to them and stuff like that so just like one example uh you know something to keep in mind because people people come from different backgrounds they have different sort of norms and ethical perspectives on how things have to be approached so sometimes my practical advice here would be sort of if you're meeting somebody new or like a new partner or a new business you know person or maybe it's a new team member on your on your direct team or somebody you have to work with just go um like half state maybe framework would be helpful to kind of understand where they're coming from or um there are some other websites i don't remember the name now but you can sort of understand their kind of cultural background and what things you should kind of keep in mind and it's a high level overview it's never like you know 100 percent solution but it kind of gives you like a quick perspective on what to expect and how to go about different things. And so that sort of approach, um, strategic cultural approach helps you to create a better connection there as well. Wow, what a comprehensive answer. And the academic in me is nerding out. You got Hofstede in there. Oh my gosh, right, all the points. You also got obviously the cultural implications and the different types of cultural backgrounds and everything collectivism so fantastic and you mentioned a team charter Stanislav he's my favorite now today so far guys okay I'm showing my bias <laughs> right but um as a lecturer who teaches in remote work at an undergrad level we do actually cover off team charters and remote team charters as part of the core curriculum at the university I'm at I have shared Charles letting you know because I saw some questions coming in on team charter I've shared the best links that I have on team charter from Lizette Sutherland, who is one of the original experts in remote work. She work, wrote one of the first books on remote work best practice. And Lizette has a fantastic uh, guide on creating a team charter or a hybrid charter. So that uh, nods to Stanislav's advice there. Hofstede as well, Charles, if anyone wants it, I have the book link handy for the Hofstede framework to look at cultural differences. So fantastic answers there. And we've actually got loads of questions coming in, so glad to see them as well. So keep them coming. So we've covered communication. Again, if I was given a half an hour in a workshop with a client, normally I start off with understanding remote work. I move on to communication and looking at that team charter or structures covering off what we've spoken about. But then the next thing, and particularly we lean into social connections, so it's really important as part of that. But the next thing that often gets asked about remote teams is how do we foster and build good collaboration? Okay, so that's the next topic I want to come to. And I thought it was really good what Vera said about if you've all got a shared goal of trying to solve a problem or build a product or whatever, then that's very much your goal, isn't it, of whatever work you do, whatever collaboration you do. So Ali, going to start with you, then go to Stanislav, Vera last. Collaboration at Juno, collaboration in your experience, Ali, how do you, what would be the tip or piece of advice you'd give on that? Yeah, team-wide OKRs that feed into everybody's departments um, and, and then into individual responsibilities. So rather than it being necessarily siloed, we, we've made this mistake. That's why we've done it. We're doing it this way now. You know, uh, departments had OKRs and that meant that people were just focused on hitting their own, their own targets. And there wasn't really that feeling of, well, if we do this, then that will impact the other department well and, and so on and so forth. So um, team-wide OKRs, uh, not having 13 people meetings, but uh, I think that we're working on that, <laughs> frankly. Um, but I think having having uh, unified goals um, is a really obvious one. Uh, I say it's obvious, Not we didn't get it right for a while. Um, 
and I'm sure there are companies that that, that aren't either. Um, and obviously, like I said, you know, if you set your company goals for the year and they are very clear, and I would say they don't change, hopefully. So, uh, you know, it might be to uh, it, it could be a revenue number, which isn't always the most inspiring thing, but for startups, I know it's extremely important. And I can tell you as a founder, it, it's unfortunately one of the key things for us now. So uh, setting very clear goals for the company at the beginning of the year is also a, a really strong thing to, to unify people. Um, in terms of the logistics, meetings have to be properly organized. Uh, action points have to be noted down. Uh, there have to be, you know, follow-ups. There's got to be some regular structure uh, so that things don't get lost. Uh, we use Monday.com, which is fine. Uh, it's it's mild mic to some people, but I think it works fine for us. Um, so so I think look, we don't overcomplicate things for sure. Uh, I think it's important that we have a team working under one one banner, and that really is the thing that is the most important for us at the moment. Nice, Ali. I'm going to put you on the spot. Can you explain for the layman, laywoman, layperson, lay them, what is an OKR? Of course. So it stands for objective and key responsibility. So an, uh, your objective might be we want to improve our sales conversion rate by threefold by the end of the year. So it needs to be fairly specific, very specific. It needs to be uh, quantifiable and it needs to have a, a date under which uh, uh, there is a, a result. So let's say we want to improve our conversion rate by um, 75% by the end of the year. And underneath that, there are key responsibilities. So every department and individual will have something that they will contribute towards that. Uh, it's important for us that we don't have very many. So perhaps no more than three for the entire company. Um, and try not to get too much overlap, but yeah, that's what an OKR is. Um, it's a, a favorite of any consultant that you might bring in or work with. Uh, <laughs> it's definitely a little bit uh, not, I mean, I, I can understand why it might seem corporate. I definitely, um, when I first heard about it, was like, oh God, process. But no, it's actually great. It's important. You, you, you don't know where you're going until you write it down on paper and, and, and sort of uh, have a good point towards it. So yeah, that's what an OKR is. And I have to vouch as a consultant who does this for companies, it does work. It's based, it comes out of agile methodology, which some of you, some of you will know as well, project methodology. For anyone in the audience who's feeling a little bit confused, scratching your head, I've got your back. Charles, I've shared two links there, one on Hofstede and one on OKRs, which is an explainer on OKRs. But Ali's explanation was really, really good. And I really want to highlight what you said about team-wide OKRs and those being visible. You had the narrow three, Ali, as well. So everyone was clear that they were aiming at those same goals. So fantastic piece of advice. The OKRs, in summary, then, will underpin what you're trying to collaborate towards, what your goal is, and you can build a collaboration, um, obviously, then out from that. Vera. Well, actually, I think that Ali <laughs> covered everything that I would say as well. <laughs> oh, wow. Amazing. That's fantastic. There's, if you, and that's even better. If you have nothing to say, that's great. We'll go to Stanislav and see if he would add anything. If not, don't be afraid to say no, it's fine. Ali gave a very comprehensive answer. Speaking of psychological safety, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, I don't don't have much to add here. It's actually on top of my mind collaboration, just because my team, since the you know the sort of the economic downturn, my team is trying to figure out different projects or initiatives to take on where we can bring additional revenue for the company, so we don't have to find ourselves in a situation where we have to you know go through like another round of layoffs and stuff like that. And so. Um, in this particular case, um, we you know, collaboration is key, right? We're meeting, we're making sure that everyone is given an opportunity to share their opinions and like ideas. We're giving people time to actually spend um, to come up with a project initiative that they think would be basically beneficial. So it's sort of like um, pitching, sort of, right? So everyone is given an opportunity to pitch their idea, and then we collectively decide, kind of talk about it, the pros and cons, and how successful it might be. And then once we hear everything everyone out we sort of have a voting process right this sort of democracy comes into play here in this particular case obviously that's like on the team level now there are some 
collaboration is a little harder to happen. I feel like when a decision comes from the top down, right? And you're just given, okay, we're all working on this. And <laughs> there is no, like, you can't really do anything about it. But I, th I think it sort of goes back to, the, to feeling, you know, safe again to be able to discuss and if you you know you don't feel like it's a good idea or you have some reservations or concerns you're at least uh, coming from a concept of like humble inquiry you know and trying to understand exactly w what are they trying to achieve right and it it's not often and it's not always that there is enough communication kind of give you, you the context of, of what the reasoning behind it is but it's up to you as a you know as an engaged, let's assume we're all engaged at our workplaces, as an engaged worker to figure out exactly where that decision's been um, sent, for, uh, like where that decision's coming from. And if you don't understand, then you do the work to actually uh, realize that. Um, so I think those are just a few thoughts I had in mind based on the most recent events. <laughs> okay, very, very interesting. I love that humble inquiry. And again, it, it leans into your point on psychological safety, what you've shared there, the story from your from your current situation. So I think that's really, really interesting. Now, we're at 48 minutes past. I've seen some of the questions come in. And Charles, I know you'll keep me right, but I know we've been answering a couple of them. But I want to make sure that we make sure we give everyone a chance to answer, answer a question. So we'll just give it a minute. And if you do have any more questions, pop them in the Q&A, because we're going to move now into full Q&A in the next couple of minutes. While we're giving the audience a chance to do that, uh, you have a fan in the audience, Ali? We have someone who's saying, I'm new to the Juno team and totally echo Ali that our remote work culture is fantastic. Everyone is equally included with, within team meetings, sharing ideas and experiences. So the check is in the post, whoever that uh, team member is, Ali, as we say. But I think that's a beautiful example of validation coming through there. And you know, your, your hesitation, your concerns that maybe there was too many meetings, that person is saying they really feel the belonging. So nice to have that there. I'm going to then pick out a couple of questions, right? One of the questions are, any concerns regarding the safeties of employees working remotely? And I guess you're talking about, and I'm not sure, potentially the issues of data security, sort of access to data, uh, etc. So I'm not sure about that. If you want to qualify that one, I'll give you a chance in the Q&A with Charles. One of the other questions that came in that I thought was, I was quite interested in, and we've kind of skirted around it a little bit, but I'm going to go to Ali first on this, then to Vera, then to Service Lab. Given everything we've spoken about, building these effective remote teams, right? We use the word engagement a lot. We use the word psych, we use the term psychological inquiry. But I think this is a really interesting related question. How important is the compatibility or chemistry between colleagues in remote work, right? And also, someone else has said, what are the do's and don'ts of meaningful relationships among team members? And I think what's interesting about these two questions is I see them related. Because what I've found has happened in the new world, and maybe it's because we've come off of that really bad experiment of everyone working from home, is that a lot of people seem to think that remote work or work of any type is your world, is your social world, is everything. And obviously some companies also give that impression with the way that they have behaved in the past years. So I think, what's your take on how important chemistry is and how important people feeling that they're really involved in a company? I wanna see our inner team. So I'm gonna go, as I said, to Ali first, then to Vera, to Stanislav. Do you think that chemistry is important in remote teams and how would we look for it or understand it? It's, it's such a tough question. It really is because on the one hand, you know, what's the what's the point of being able to hire from multiple diverse backgrounds, stories, you know, neurodiversities, you know, what's the point if you're then also optimizing for chemistry? It's like one doesn't always equate to the other necessarily. And I remember I used to hate when I was, you know, back before I started com my company, I used to kind of it used to irk me that people would hire specifically on culture fit because it's like you i kind of understand it i completely understand it you know you want to make sure that the people that you hire play well together work well together understand each other but i think it really more comes down to maybe rather than chemistry it is a bit more about values so there's that so we want to optimize for values because you can still be different 
as a person, you can be introvert, extrovert, ambivert, you can be however you want to be, but you have to share similar values and the same values as the business. So it's not easy. I, I don't know the answer, really. I mean, I, you would really want companies to be a little bit more open minded um, because you don't want homogenous team. And, what, you know, what's the point of hiring across different cultures if, you, if, you, if that's what you're looking for? That being said, we're really small, right? Uh, in comparison to some large organizations, you know, say you would be one of them, and let's say Oyster HR, one of our clients, who's like six, six hundred people. But for us, as a small team, we hire for people that we sense will be able to have an input on the culture and actually drive it forward. We don't really have space in this current phase for passengers. We want people to be inge ingenious. We want people to make their own, take their own initiative. That we want people to help us shape how things sh should be. And you know, we hire for that. We hire. We, we we part of what we hire for are people who are going to make an impression on the way that we work. You know, uh, and, and give their opinions as well. That being said, by the way, chemistry. I mean. If you're physically working, it's pretty obvious. It's much more obvious to tell if there's no chemistry. If you're physically there, there's like all of the nonverbal and the body language and stuff like that. So I don't know. It's not really much of an answer, to be honest with you. I, I don't know how to answer that question. I'm just trying to give you my my what comes to mind as soon as I think about chemistry and and getting. Yeah. Into I don't I don't either. And I, I've, been, I've seen a lot of debates on social media recently about, oh, work from home or remote work. You know, you've got no social life. I'm someone who, yes, has contacts in work, but they're not my social life. So <laughs> work is not all my social life. Now, again, I'm 50 years of age and maybe a different generation. I get all that. But I think, you know, I think you really answered honestly, because we, we're looking at this global diversity, global talent pool. Where does it start and end, as you say, Ali, in terms of where people should feel that real engagement and connection? And I'm going to answer, right? I think you have to ask the person. And you have to see what they say in the moment in a one-on-one. -on -one. And then you also have to be willing, if you care as an employer and as a as a as a leader that's servant leader, practices servant leadership, that their answer may change in time. So you have to ask again. Because I certainly know, for example, when my daughter was young, I didn't want socialization from work. I was too focused on just being a parent. So it really changes as well in your in your life stages, doesn't it? And depending on your responsibilities. Anyways, I had to get my tuppence in because I feel that that's a question that we shouldn't necessarily be putting on to work for all the answers or employment for all the answers. Vera, your perspective on that? Yes, um, I think that, um, first of all, uh, I believe that it, there is speaking from you know I've 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 grown up on the internet you know so um, feeling chemistry with someone on the screen <laughs> I don't I I used not to, yeah you know it was the only thing I knew till I was 25 uh, it's only in the past you know five yeah seven years that I actually have people in my in my real life that we call it if you live online you know you have your online life and if you uh, if you uh, uh um if you uh yeah if you just look at your friends and family that's your in real life again gaming terms uh so i think that everyone can build chemistry if you have a natural chemistry uh then that it it will make things easier i mean if if you work with someone that shares the same jokes that shares the you know the, the gets your cheekiness i mean if you send a meme to someone and someone totally gets it you know uh it will make it easier, but it's not necessarily needed in order to create teams. I think it's way more um, uh, it's way more important to actually find a mutual understanding and gain respect for each other in the way how people think, the way they ha act, the way they communicate. So it's again about the intentionality because I think that if you have a colleague um, that might be uh, the total opposite of you, uh, that person can be so great to get input and see things that you don't see. For example, I had a couple of colleagues that, you know, on a personal life, if, if I would see them in, you know, in person, it, it, it also always felt a little bit awkward because I didn't know how to communicate with them. But if we were on a professional level, that person was, was the person I needed to just bounce my ideas off because in that way we did connect. And it's again, you know, the, the shared values, the shared, the shared objective is, 
if you accept that everyone's different and that some people are closer to you because you have the same vibe, um, but the other one doesn't, and that person is actually the one that you need, then, then you slowly and certainly, if you try to get to know them or indeed try to, to work in the way that they work and gain an understanding of them, then that chemistry uh, will be formed regardless. I'm 100% sure of that. Beautiful, Vera. So on the top, I can give you 30 seconds because we're just running out of time. Would you add anything? And if you don't have anything to add, it's fine. Yeah, no, for me, I don't think chemistry is necessarily a requirement. For me, chemistry equals to likability. And you don't necessarily have to like, you know, one another to be able to work. But I think what's important is to invest time and resources into establishing a connection. And, you know, it can be as easy as like trying to figure out what their hobbies are, again, going to, to values and stuff like that. And that would ultimately actually create the likability anyway, right? Because if you find out, oh, you have common interests, it's like maybe you like playing football or you like going hiking and stuff like that. It's something you can talk outside of work, which would help to foster that stronger connection between the people. And in my experience and my personal beliefs, I think if you have a strong connection, you actually can build a pretty efficient team that would be successful in achieving the goals you put in front of them. So that's my quick perspective there. Fantastic. So we've covered such a wide, wide, wide range of things now. A couple of questions came in on onboarding as well. And we have got another Safety Wing webinar coming up, I believe, on the 18th. I'm just going to make sure I've said that date right. And I know Charles has shared, 18th of March, has shared the link to that next month. So that is completely on onboarding remote and hybrid employees. So for those of you who asked questions on onboarding and didn't get your answers, please register for that webinar and we'll be covering that specifically. So we've covered so much. We've covered, uh, as I would say, if I was doing a workshop with some of my clients on remote uh, team leadership, I would be looking at some of these key things we've covered off. Communications, creating social connection, building team rapport, where does chemistry start and end uh, in terms of the responsibility from the team leader or the employer? How do we look at fostering that team morale? Where do we look for it in the virtual world? How do we foster it when we're together in real life? We even leaned into some lovely cultural frameworks like Hofstede. We looked as well at psychological safety and some fantastic tips on that. We touched on OKRs. And actually what we also leaned into is really good one-to-ones as well, which would be the gel in good leadership of bringing a lot of those elements together. On the dot on the hour, Ali in Barcelona, muil gracias, muchísimas gracias, Vera in Belgium, and Stanislav in New York on behalf of Safety Wing. Thank you so much for joining today. I hope to see you at another webinar soon. Take care and have a lovely rest of the day.